gentlemen and ladies, welcome back. That's show you've been waiting for, show you've been waiting for all these, yes. It's show we go back in time for, uh, back when uh, wrestling was uh, wrestling and not sports entertainment. Back when there was wrestling in all 50 states, no exceptions. Territories ruled uh, the wrestling landscape. Uh, titles were called belts. Uh, medical facilities were called hospitals. And sports entertainment was professional wrestling. Oh no! Uh, big week um, in the uh, tag team world of wrestling, and in the NWA. This is the NWA centric week, Dan, in professional wrestling history. Uh, we're going to go back to September tenth, nineteen eighty, in Ohuru, Japan, where Harley Race would defeat Giant Baba, the great Shuhai Giant Baba, uh, to regain. The NWA Championship it seems the Giant Baba had beaten Race for the NWA title on September 5th, and five days later, Harley Race would regain the belt. This this would be Harley Race's fifth NWA title reign, and Giant Baba that would be that would end his third. Now Giant Baba, uh, leader of uh, New Japan uh, Pro Wrestling and a legit seven footer. And one of the founding fathers of Japanese pro wrestling uh, would be NWA champion three times. When the NWA champion would invariably go to uh, Japan to defend the NWA title, it all was almost like a rite of passage, or as the French say, rite de passage, that the NWA champion would drop the belt to Baba on his first day in Japan on tour and then regained the belt from Bob before they left. So this happened with Jack Briscoe in 1975. It happened with Harley Race in 1979. Then it happened again with Harley Race this date in 1980. So Giant Baba, a three-time NWA heavyweight champion, but all three reigns equaled a total of 19 days. Wow. Okay. Yes. Sure. So, <laughs> quality over quantity in those uh, in this case, but Giant Baba will always be known as a three-time NWA heavyweight champion. Um, but his his third and final reign came to an end uh, September tenth, nineteen eighty. Speaking of things coming to an end, glorious things coming to an end. Uh, it happened on this date, September tenth, nineteen eighty-eight, right here. The beautiful Philadelphia Civic Center, where I was in attendance, along with NBA Hall of Famer Charles Barkley, sitting ringside at the scorer's table for this very match. He came out to this very match, introduced to the crowd, held up both of his hands and his four fingers, because this was the main event of this match is September 10th, 1988 at the Philadelphia Civic Center. The United States Tag Team Champions, the Midnight Express, Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton, will be taking on the NWA World Tag Team Champions, Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard. Both Jim Cornette and J.J. Dillon interfered for both on behalf of both of their teams throughout the match. In the end, Arn Anderson had pinned Stan Lane while Bobby Eaton had pinned Tully Blanchard. The referee counted both pins, but raised the hand of the Midnight Express. So the Midnight Express became the first and only team to win the NWA Tag Team Championship while they were the United States Tag Team Champions. Well, well that never occurred to me before. Yes. So wow. one, one team held both belts. And with that, that would be the last time that Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson wrestled in the NWA. They would start if the, in the WWF inside of two months as the Brain Busters, managed by the great Bobby Heenan. But not only was that the last time that Tully and Arn would wrestle in the NWA, that would be the last time they'd ever wrestle as a team in the NWA. And that match with that loss with that loss, would, in effect, end the Four Horsemen. The original Four Horsemen, yeah. Yeah. A um, question. You brought it up. Yes. Sir. Do you like the Brain Busters better, or do you like them and the Four Horsemen better? 
I like them in the Four Horsemen uh, better. I think as the Brain Busters, you had them primarily as a team. And the Four Horsemen, you know, you can mix mix and match. Uh, Arn and Rick would be a tag team. Tully and Rick would be a tag team. Or Tully and Luger or Tully and Barry Windham um, were also a tag team. Uh, I Them being just a tag team kind of uh, – it, it didn't – take away from their greatness because if anything you got to see how great a team they were in the WWF where they were concentrated just basically solely as a team and they see why they were Hall of Famers but uh, I, I obviously were always going to prefer them in the in the Four Horsemen uh, but they're uh, the last time that Tully and Arn would ever be a team in the NWA uh, took place right here in Philly September 10th, 1988, at the Philadelphia Civic Center, when I saw the Midnight Express um, win their uh, only. Now, here's the thing. The Midnight Express, someone say the Stan Lane, Bobby Eaton version of the Midnight Express was the superior version to the Dennis Condry, Bobby Eaton Midnight Express. But this was the only world title that uh, Bobby and Stan ever won. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, ability-wise, maybe. But hardware-wise, you can obviously make the argument. I prefer um, mm-hmm. Condry Bobby. Yeah, they they were the originals. They were the. Um, I think they worked best with the rock and roll. Um, I guess because all four men know each other better than anyone, and it's no slight to Stan Lane. No, um, not at because all. he 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 could do things that Dennis Condry obviously could not, and um, I it made the their double teams were a lot better, a lot crisper with Bobby and Stan. They could do a lot more uh, double team moves. And with Stan and um, Jim Cornette even pointed this out, I could do things with Stan. I couldn't never, I couldn't do with Dennis. You know, the flapjack was a lot better with Stan. The double goozle was better with Stan. Um, the vegematic was um, just was better with Stan. And, you know, in one of those what-if scenarios, you know, what if, if Dennis Condry had never left the Midnight Express, um, what would happen? Or in this what-if scenario, what if Bobby Eaton was the one who left the Midnight Express instead of Dennis Condry? Uh, I don't think there, in my opinion, I don't think there would be a Midnight Express. If Bobby Eaton left, I think it would – I think – I think we can both agree Bobby Eaton is the catalyst for both. If, if Bobby Eaton's not involved, I wouldn't have given a crap. No, if, if Bobby Eaton's gone, there's no Midnight Express. No, I absolutely agree. And that's no slight against Dennis Condry. They got someone else. Um, I think he would have changed the name and gone another direction, but I don't think you would call yourself the Midnight Express because no. Bobby Eaton makes that engine go. I, I agree. It, it, it basically was Bobby Eaton and whoever the hell he was taking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but, uh, yeah, September 10th, 1988. Uh, September 11th. Uh, the only thing that uh, that that happened of of consequences in wrestling wise, we know September 11th is a is a landmark date. But um, the only the big thing that happened was in 1965 in uh, Long Island. Um, Stork brought a uh, delivery of mass quantities that was been bestowed upon us, the wrestling fans, and a gift that keeps giving. Uh, now, every Monday now, uh, happy belated 55th birthday to Paul Heyman. Ah. Uh-uh. One of the better Blu-ray releases the WWE ever put out, by the way. Yes. He's got a hell of a story. It, 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 it's one of the only, the only Blu-ray I've ever gotten from the WWE. Uh, his story is it, his, it, it's great, of even just being a wrestling fan. Because uh, we're the same age, so he was doing things that I had never had the guts. Like, man, I would You're love old. to. Yeah, I am old, and we both are. And, uh, but good news, I don't look like Alfred Hitchcock. That's true. That, you look much better. Thank you. The way that that Paulie does. I was trying. I was trying to tell uh, Harry the other day. He was. We were talking about. Uh, I I forgot what the beginning of the conversation was, but I was like, I mentioned your age just in passing, assuming he knew. And my point was that the expression that you have. Taught, I, Black don't crack, the one you taught me. Yeah. And he was like, H- Craig's 50? Yeah. And I said, yeah. He goes, he looks younger than you. I said, go F yourself, but yeah. <laughs> yes. 
And I was like, that's not a, that's not a stereotype. It just happens to be true. <laughs> that's one. And, but the, my other thing as to why I don't, uh, I always just hold up two things with two fingers when people ask me why, you know, you, you look younger when I get compliment on it. Um, yeah. Uh, no wife, no kids. <laughs> <laughs> Never been married. No, I don't have any kids. Why do I look like this? Okay. What did you, you have for lunch? You know what? Never mind. <laughs> I, f- I think I know why. But, uh, yeah, the, if the, the Blu-ray on, uh, on Paul Heyman, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Heyman. Um, uh, a, it's a great story. He was he was a kid. Like I said, we were the same age. But he went down to Madison Square Garden. You know, lied backstage that he was a photographer. You know, got in uh, with the uh, the management. You know, uh, he got to know certain people. They liked him. He liked them. They liked him. And you know, the Matt, Freddie Blassie, Grand Wizard, Lou Albano, and he got to know all these. You know, he got to know the ins and outs through you know from the from the out from the inside out and uh, a true great you know story and he did it on his own and he rubbed and he continued to succeed despite rubbing every single person he met the wrong way even the people that speak glowingly of paul Heyman will have, still have a paul Heyman story where he lied to them he screwed them over he still owes them money he you know went back on his word he you know did that but you cannot argue with his success Somebody in wrestling was a bastard no yeah <laughs> shocked yeah but uh he's uh and he's still on on tv now with uh he got a second lease on life with uh with roman reigns fired from his position as head of raw uh but still on TV, nonetheless, I'm I'm guessing this would be more of a relief to him that he doesn't have to worry about the ins and outs of doing a three-hour show. Now he can concentrate on just being an on-air personality. But um, so far, as a the manager to the heel, Roman Reigns, doing an amazing job. So happy belated 55th birthday to the psycho yuppie from Scarsdale, Long Island. Psycho the yuppie. Former Paulie Dangerously. <sighs> Paul Heyman. Uh, September 12th, 1982. We're going back to Japan, Dan. Uh-oh. When Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cronodal in a tournament final in Tokyo, Japan, defeated the team of Antonio Inoki and Giant Baba to win the NWA Tag Team Championship. But not really. Because there was no tournament it did not take place in Japan, and Antonio Inoki and Giant Baba did not team up, could not team up, because Giant Baba is the president of New Japan, and Antonio Inoki is the president of All Japan, and they not only would not even have, would never have teamed up, but if they did, they certainly wouldn't do a job for a couple of guy G's uh, like Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cronodal. So this uh, tournament that was published in all the wrestling magazines that I bought and I, you know, believed was just to cover up the fact that the current NWA tag team champions, Ole Anderson and Stan Hansen had broken up and Ole had quit the wrestling business and wanted to go back to promoting and Stan, of course, didn't want to be locked down to one territory. He wanted to go to Japan. So to cover the tag team of Ole Anderson and Stan Hansen, the end of the current NWA Tag Team Champions breaking up. They had a tournament in Japan, won by Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cronodal. So they just handed them the belts. Won't be the last time a belt is handed to someone on this edition of the Wrestling Historian, but stay tuned. Um, in our previous uh, episode of HIAC Talk Radio, we talked about ratings, how uh, – AEW uh, this past week crossed the 1 million views mark, and that's a reason to celebrate uh, in this day and age. But you're going to throw that in our face, aren't you? No, I'm not. I'm just going to point out in September uh, 12th of 1986 was the edition of uh, Saturday Night's main event where um, Hulk Hogan took on um, uh, Bob Orton and – Roddy Piper came out to uh, make the save, 
and Hulk went to hit Piper and didn't, and they left with a stare down. Piper would come back and beat the Iron Sheik in a with a roll up, even though he was Pedro Morales was uh, his uh, was supposed to be the Iron Sheik's original opponent. You see, Piper had his knee uh, injured by Adrian Adonis and uh, his former ace, Cowboy Bob Orton Jr. and Don Morocco. So he came out to get revenge on Adrian Adonis, broke a crutch over Adrian's uh, arm, breaking it because um, Piper was on crutches. But that uh, officially turned Roddy Piper face, uh, of course, leading up to his WrestleMania retirement match uh, later on next, the following year at WrestleMania III, uh, his first of many retirements. Uh, also on that card, uh, Ricky Steamboat uh, in his revenge match against Jake the Snake Roberts for the uh, DDT on the concrete incident. Uh, this was the match where uh, Jake brought out the snake and uh, Ricky brought out the Komodo dragon whose jaws were taped shut. And they ran both animals together in the center of the ring and yeah, both wrestlers had to act like it had exploded. But uh, and also uh, the opening match, uh, Lanny Poffo was pinned by the late great Kamala. Ah. In the opening match, uh, Saturday night's main event, uh, September twelfth, nineteen eighty six, and that show did a nine point four rating. Wow! Well, see, <laughs> you threw it back in my face. You knew it was coming. I knew it was coming, you bastard. Uh, I just want to put this in uh, because I'm a fan of you, Dan. Uh, so on the same date, September 12, 1999, Fall Brawl. Uh, main event, Sting defeated Hulk Hogan for the WCW Heavyweight Championship. Despite interference from Bret Hart, Lex Luger, Sid Vicious, DDP, a baseball bat. Uh, but Sting went over Hulk Hogan and won his sixth WCW slash NWA Heavyweight Championship. Uh, most interesting, though, was the opening bout, Dan. Uh, Rey Mysterio, Billy Kidman, and Eddie Guerrero defeated the team of Vampiro and the Insane Clown Posse. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you want me to say about this pay-per-view. <laughs> like, like... Do, you, do, you, do you remember it, though? Yes, yeah, do I remember? I'm asking. Well, so you don't know what to don't say. Don't yell at me, you son of a bitch. Uh, I remember it by tuning in. <laughs> I remember it coming up, and me going. Uh, they're not announcing. They're not announcing a war games. <laughs> What's going on here? And they never did. They they never did war games again. We don't count. I mean, they kind of did war games with the triple threat cage, but they, they it wasn't really the war game anymore. Um, so I remember tuning in going, wow, they're really not doing war games. I don't care. <laughs> but I remember this is the show that they tried to turn Sting heel, officially. And they had the um, workings of it between him and Hulk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were going off the, well, Hulk Hogan, you've been... Hi, me Harry. I like ice cream. Me Harry, type in chat. Ugh, rhyme me. Anyway, um, so they they were making it. They were working off that NWO thing where, well, you the you've been the a hole for the last couple of years. I don't trust you. Only for Sting to pick up a bat that Lex Luger dropped and beat the holy hell out of Hulk. The only problem is the seven thousand in attendance at the Lawrence Joel uh, Arena in Winston Salem <laughs> didn't boost Sting. <laughs> They yeah. cheered him because this is NWA country and F Hulk Hogan times two because he's a piece of crap. Yeah. And they went crazy. They, that little crowd that they drew in the first place because it was like, Fall Bro, who gives a, <laughs> who gives a crap? And then his, the rest of his heel turn was uh, yeah. kind of yeah. crap. But... um. Isn't that the same? This is the same show. I'm reading the card. All I had to do was read the card to remember where uh, it was supposed to be Berlin, who, um, for those who don't know, was the revamp of Alex Wright. I happen to like that gimmick as a heel gimmick. Hogan killed it. Another reason why, two point, uh, why. Hogan you know, kills, every, Hogan kills he, everything. 
Alex Wright finally found a gimmick that worked for him. Yeah. And he changed his name to Berlin, would only do interviews in German, okay, which is going to get heat, especially in the South. Anyway, yeah, just saying yeah. the word German. They don't even like a German chocolate cake down there. And he was getting unreal heat, but it would be – and it would be equal to the level of Hogan. So Hogan kept him off cards and, and, and telecast intentionally for enough time passed that when he came back, NWA was growing so strong that whatever Alex Wright did before that went away. So, yeah, but I think you could have made a ton of money with Alex Wright as Berlin. You didn't even have to give him a stable or give him a tag team partner, just... Uh, Harry said he likes the tie. I know you're shocked about that. Thank you, great one. Um... Yeah, I, I'm just thinking back on the Berlin thing, and I remember him sitting at ringside a few shows mm-hmm. and Tony going, is that Alex Wright? I'm like, why? Why are you telling us who it is? We all know who it is. Why did you? <sighs> and I like Tony, but whoever was producing that reveal was just a, you've killed it already. Yeah, no, no, duh, it's Alex Wright. Thank you. Well, the, 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 and the end of the WCW back then was killing a lot of things, and which I'll get to in a, later. Yeah, shooting themselves in the foot, which I have no doubt that was their idea. Alex Wright there. Just gonna put the camera on him. Just put the camera on him. Yeah. And you don't have to, but anyway. Anyway. Speaking of killing things when they did need to be killed. Uh, or the direction the WCW was going in and the bad decisions they made. It all came to a head September 13th, 1998. as the year before Fall Brawl. Uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, it was one of the most emotional live editions of Nitro I've ever seen and one of the best television segments uh, ever done. Um, in Greenville, South Carolina... Uh, they brought J.J. Dillon to the ring in a tux, and he introduced uh, the Four Horsemen. He introduced Arn Anderson first. Arn introduced uh, Steve McMichael, grown, uh, and then <laughs> Chris Benoit, and then Dean Malenko. I don't know why Four Horsemen and Steve McMichael should never be in the same time. <laughs> I know. Especially when we talked in this very edition of um, Wrestling Story and about Tully and Arn and the great and the, that being the end of the Horsemen when you had you know Barry Windham, Flair, Lex Luger, guys that could legitimately go whether you liked them or not, but then you put Steve McMichael in there. I always you talk about worst Horsemen. I will put Paul Roma over Steve McMichael every day of the week and twice on Sunday. But in this particular moment, they're introducing the four Horsemen in Horseman Country in Greenville, South Carolina. All you know. Four men, Arn, uh, Mongo, Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko wearing tuxedos and talking about how great it is to finally be back. And then Arn said, oh, I almost forgot, and Ric Flair. And this was Ric Flair's first return on WCW in uh, almost a year. Uh, a year last spring, of the, the spring previous, uh, Flair was scheduled to appear on a WCW Thunder episode and he asked for to take that night off to see his son Reed uh, wrestle. Uh, Eric Bischoff said no and Flair went anyway. So Eric Bischoff suspended him. And so when Flair was introduced <laughs> And Flair said, okay, I'll see you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Flair was introduced and uh, came out to a tremendous ovation. Uh, legitimate tears in his eyes and he cut this uh, unbelievable emotional promo. And he sh- he did a shoot on on Eric Bischoff. You yeah. are an ass. <laughs> you're yeah. obnoxious. You're obnoxious, overbearing asshole. You but, suck. But he, he talked about uh, he talked about some legitimate things that um, us fans didn't know about. Um, when I had to, um, you had my best friend Arn Anderson when he was uh, we announced his retirement. Uh, you wanted to bury him. He at, When uh, Arne announced his retirement on uh, Nitro, 
Eric Bischoff called Ric Flair, and according to Rick, their conversation was, now the horsemen are done. Now you can bury the horsemen. And Flair was, he had to look himself in the mirror, and, and he, he was ashamed, and he, he, he couldn't believe that. Um, and when I had to say goodbye to Arn in the ring, that was real. He said, after he, it was over, Eric said to Rick, God, that's good TV. Watching Flair cry and saying goodbye to Arn Anderson, he said, God, that's good TV. Yeah, that wasn't good TV. That was real. When Sting crying in my dressing room after he won his championship and he, I was crying with him, that wasn't ratings. That was real. Okay, mm-hmm. this right here, this is real. And that's what you don't get. And you tried to S-can my uh, career for uh, most of it. But um, abuse of power. Abuse of power. That's what you are. Uh, but an amazing um, – Amazing promo, one of the great uh, live moments uh, in wrestling, in televised wrestling, and in ni- definitely in Nitro history. But uh, it goes to- we, we always talk about the Jericho pop and the other pops that have happened over the years, but that one, yeah, that was nineteen eighty five again. Yeah, it was, it was so loud, and even the dumbest Mark would have sat there and gone, oh, "I think that a little bit of that's real." <laughs> Yeah, or as what we call on Twitter because we use inter- industry terms now, a work shoot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every every word out of his mouth was uh was real. That uh, that uh, Rick Flair's return on Monday Nitro, September thirteenth, nineteen ninety eight, is as real as real TV gets. Uh, very emotional night. Uh. September 14th, Dan, we're going to go back to 1937 uh, with a landmark decision that happened in the NWA. I told you this was an NWA-centric uh, wrestling historian. But what happened on this date, September 14th, 1937, still resonates today and uh, held forth and went on through the decades. Um, September 14th, 1937, Dan, John Pesek was awarded the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Now, you and everyone else listening go, who the hell is John Pesek? Well, John Pesek was a he was, he was a legit wrestler, in, uh, born in Nebraska, known, known as the, the Nebraska Wild Man, um, great Olympic wrestler, uh, not a household name by any means, but a very good um, wrestler in his day, especially in 1937. But he was awarded the NWA championship because um, the NWA decided that who, whomever was the NWA champion, they would have to post a one thousand dollar bond when they were champion. Yeah, yeah. This goes back to that story about uh, Rick. We always tell it. Uh, you know. Exactly. Well, it started way back in 1937. Uh, Everett Marshall was the champion at the time. Um, we, he was a champion when the decision was made, but when the NWA announced the decision that the uh, there would that a thousand dollars would have to be posted by the champion, Everett refused. The only contender that would post a thousand dollars was John Pesek, and because of that, John Pesek was awarded the NWA championship because either he had the money or was willing to post the money, whatever the reason, John Pesek, when he posted his $1,000 for, uh, for the championship that Everett Marshall didn't, John Pesek was awarded the NWA title. Uh, right. The NWA. Sure. <laughs> uh, according to who you want to believe, the NWA uh, reconsidered their decision. Another story was that John Pesek, who was a legit Olympian freestyle wrestler, and in the 20s, um, it became the working agreement that, that wrestlers, their wrestling matches would be predetermined, and he didn't like that, and he was never a big fan of that. I hate to tell you. So, so depending on who you – the NWA re, uh, reconsidered their decision to put it on him because of how he felt about wrestling. Uh, another story was that they had challengers lined up for him, and P- Pesic didn't want to face them, either because he was afraid that they he would be asked to lose to one of them, or they would try to wrestle him for real. But uh, but in either 
and either way, it was reconsidered to not put the keep the title on John Pesek, and the NWA title was not defended, and it wasn't until three months later when Luthez defeated Everett Marshall in December to win the NWA championship. So all that took place for Luthez to win his first NWA title in December of that year. And I'll get to that December in a future wrestling story. And when Luthez wins his first NWA title, the first of six, which was then a record uh, when he beat Everett Marshall for the NWA title, but he would not have had the NWA title. He wouldn't have had to beat Everett Marshall for the NWA title had uh, John Pesek not set the precedent of having the champion put up, in this case, 1937, $1,000. And as we know, as we've talked about this, Dan, that bond has gone up to the point where Ric Flair, uh, when he was asked to return the belt, didn't receive the bond he put up for it. And that's what prompted him to leave the NWA for the WWF <laughs> with the belt in tow. And over, over that bond, was, which started at 1000 and went up to, what was Rick, was it 25000 I, I think by the time Rick and Jim had that thing, he was, he was mentioning a $2,500 down payment, I believe. Okay. And that's when Jim Harry was like, I'm getting the belt. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and Rick was like, I, I own it. Yeah. If you want to return my bond. But yeah, but it started with, uh, with John Pesek, who set the trend. An interesting footnote on John Pesek. After he left wrestling, Dan, he went on to he he entered the world of greyhound dog racing. <laughs> All right, sure. And he excelled at it to the point where John Pesek's greyhounds, two of them, won the world greyhound championships in '54 and '56. And by 1975, 95 percent of the racing greyhounds in America were from John Pesek's breeds. All right. Okay. So, sure. Yeah. I never thought I'd be mentioning Greyhound wrestling, Greyhound dog racing in a wrestling podcast, right. but uh, yeah, so, but John Pesek, the first man to put up a bond for the, uh, for the world championship, uh, a thing that still, that existed for the next uh, 60 plus years in the NWA, uh, but it started there. And that- That's a story I didn't know, man. That's why we do this, Dan. Yes, thank you, I appreciate it. fill the folks in it. You know, all the stuff, you know, we take for granted the champ's gotta put up a bond and had to start somewhere, this is where it started. Uh, way back in 1937. It was wrestling back then, folks. It was a big deal. And, uh, and no bigger deal than the NWA. Nope. And that, wrestling fans, is a wrestling historian. And my name is Craig Lagans. And you can reach me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Craig Lagans. That's C R A I G L I W G E O N S. I'm Dan Calchico. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, and Facebook at DanLaw83. VOC Nation Radio Network is at VOCNation.com on your app. On your podcast app on your smartphone, type of music nation, radio network, or watch live on twitch.tv slash danlaw83. Watch it later on youtube.com slash danlaw83. Make it real easy. For the even easier, in more ways than one, Craig McGonnott. How do you bump out comedian Dan Calchico? What, Craig? Oh, I'm easy. <laughs> like Sunday morning? Yeah, well, especially these days. <laughs> Including me. Don't trust me. See you next week. Bye.